A Baby Changes Everything. I think it's a really powerful song. I actually want to just maybe show you the lyrics again for a moment uh, up here on the screen. The reason, at least to me, it's so powerful is that when you first hear maybe the first two verses, you don't know who exactly we're, we're singing about. It's just a teenage girl who's pregnant uh, out of wedlock, and you get drawn into her pain and her fear and the fact that she is worried that everything is going to go uh, badly. And your heart begins to hurt for her. By the time you get to verse 4 and verse 5, you start to have a sense that this baby girl is, is Mary. And your mind is drawn to the fact that she was a teenage girl and that she experienced great pain herself. And your heart is drawn to the fact of her suffering and the difficulty that she went through. By the time you get to verses six and seven, you realize that a baby changes everything is not just about some unknown pregnant teenage girl or even Mary. It's about everybody. Shepherds and angels gather around and you realize that this baby that changes everything, this baby is coming to change everything for the whole world. And then the most powerful verse of the whole song is verse eight. And all of a sudden you realize the baby that changes everything doesn't just change everything for some hurt teenage girl or for Mary, for the whole world, but for me. And really, verse 8 becomes our song. My whole life has turned around. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And this baby that was born to a teenage girl out of wedlock who suffered and struggled, did so to rescue the whole world and you and me. A baby changes everything. We want to think this morning just for a few minutes, how is it that a baby changes everything? not just for Mary and for the whole world, but for you and for me. Let's pray together, and then we're going to look at a passage of the Bible that helps explain why a baby changes everything. Would you bow your heads as I pray? Father, what a beautiful song. Thank you for giving words to the emotions in our heart. Uh, Lord, some may identify exactly with what Mary was going through. Uh, Lord, to know what it's like to be a teenage girl with an unexpected pregnancy, the difficulties and dangers of wondering uh, if she could ever be trusted again, the difficulties that Mary went through, the long journey, uh, the rumors, the slander that was spoken about her. Lord, some here may know that feeling. Lord, others know exactly the feeling of this last verse of what it's like to be lost, just adrift, in the midst of darkness, confused, not sure where we're going. God, it's your gift to us, Jesus, that changes everything. But Lord, how can this be? How can it be that we could understand these truths? Only by your spirit. And so, Father, we pray that right now as we open your word, you would give us understanding. We pray that right now you would open heaven up and allow us to see and to know and to hear. Lord, we pray that right now you would do uh, the great miracle that Christmas is and cause heaven to come to earth in a real and tangible way that we might know, we might understand the depth of the love that you have for us and the good that you have purposed for us. And Lord, any who are lost today might be found. And all those who have been found might rejoice. We pray this in the name of that baby, 
who has grown to become our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A baby changes everything. How? Well, I'd like you to turn to a passage of Scripture so that we can talk about that. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you. And if you take one of those Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 8, which is page 558, 558 in the church Bibles, Isaiah chapter 8, just to give you some context, we as a church have been going through the book of Isaiah. This is an Old Testament book of prophecy, meaning this book was written 700 years before Jesus was born. And in it, God, the God who created the whole world, is revealing himself and his heart to us. Now, Isaiah 8 is a passage of scripture that we've already covered before in the church. So if you're just here this week, you didn't miss anything. You're here for the right time. We're glad to have you here. When we were in Isaiah a few weeks ago, Isaiah 8, It happened to be the Sunday that followed right after the terrible shooting in the synagogue in Pittsburgh. It also was the week in which three local high schools here in West Michigan received bomb threats. It was also the Sunday right before the midterm elections. And we were looking in Isaiah 8 talking about fear. And I want to go back to sort of where we were at that point, and we're going to start in verse 19. If you're not super familiar with the Bible, you just want to be on page 558. You see that big eight, that means chapter eight, that's in the left-hand column. On the right-hand column, you'll see where it says the darkness turns to light, that little superscripted 19, that's verse 19, that's where I'm going to start reading. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, They will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. When they look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Now, when we looked at this passage before, I reminded you that the proper English plural for the word medium is not the word mediums, but the word media. And the point was is that when you and I engage with news media and social media that is not oriented around the word of God, the result is our lives are full of darkness. You read the news, you hear what's going on, you experience the conflict between individuals and friends, and the more you engage with the media, the more it fills your heart with darkness. But the reason it does so is not because there's something wrong with the media. It's because the world is full of darkness. People, a person did actually call in bomb threats to three local high schools. That wasn't made up. Someone did actually go into a synagogue and kill a number of harmless people simply out of hatred and fear. There is corruption in politics. And the trouble continues. Even this week, our government is in partial shutdown. You feel the darkness in China. The government is persecuting currently churches who are naming the name of Jesus. In the country of Yemen, there is a humanitarian crisis. 22 million people 
in a very difficult and horrific situation because of war and corruption and darkness. The problem with media is it's just simply a window into the world as it is. And the problem is the world in which we live is full of darkness and gloom and trouble. And the more you and I experience what's going on in the world, the more we feel exactly what God is talking about. That darkness, the gloom, the fear, the war, the oppression, the injustice. But the reason why God says, look, why are you consulting media? The reason he asked that question is because although media, news media and social media, are relatively good at helping us understand the darkness in the world, what media is not good at is helping us to see that in the midst of the darkness, God is doing something. And so God says in the midst of the trouble, why are you looking to the group that's only really good at transmitting more of the trouble to you? Why not look to the one who loves you and who created all things and who has the power to do something about the darkness and the gloom and the war and the oppression? What is it that God is doing in the midst of darkness? Move with me into chapter nine. Nevertheless, even though the world is full of darkness, difficulty, and trouble, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. Do you hear that? That is the announcement that in the midst of difficulty and pain and suffering, both individually and amidst the world as a whole, God says, I'm going to bring good. Instead of gloom and distress, there will be blessing. And chapter nine introduces the promise of God for blessing. It says in the past, still in the middle of verse one, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Now, this is surprising to us because what God is saying here is the blessing that's going to come is going to come from the least likely place in Israel and perhaps on earth. Zebulun and Naphtali are the northern tribes of Israel. They're the ones that get overrun in Isaiah by Assyria. They've been conquered so many times by Gentiles that they're known now as the Galilee of the Gentiles or Galilee of the nations, same word. And the idea is, is that's not the part of Israel that you would expect the promise of God's blessing to come from. That's the part that's been most run down, most humbled, least faithful to their Jewish heritage. Verse two, but God has promised blessing. What does that blessing look like? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You saw in that video that we showed a little bit earlier. You know, the amazing thing about light is it doesn't matter how dark the room is. Once you light a light, once you light a candle, once you turn on a flashlight, once you turn on a lamp, the darkness has to flee. It has to leave. There is no light that can be overcome by darkness. Darkness has no power. And God says, in the midst of the darkness and distress and gloom of life, I will light a light. And the darkness will not be able to overcome it. Verse three. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Not only does light, sorry, does darkness give way to light, gloom, will give way to joy. 
as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Kids, some of you will feel this way on Tuesday morning. That's what he's talking about. Dividing the plunder is enjoying the presence, the goodness of life, and the promise here of God. It's a future promise from the time it was written. A promise is is that in the midst of gloom, maybe you've had a terrible year at school. Maybe you've had some difficult experiences with friends. The promise is, is God says, I'm going to turn that gloom to joy. The kind of joy you feel when you open up the present that you've been waiting all year for. Verse four. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Darkness gives way to light. Gloom gives way to joy. Oppression gives way to freedom. God's promising here freedom. Freedom from oppression. Verse five. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Darkness gives way to light. Gloom gives way to joy. Oppression gives way to freedom. And war gives way to peace. This is the promise of blessing. When God looks out into a world that he created, but because of human sin is full of darkness, gloom, and distress, he promises a blessing. A blessing is coming that will turn that darkness into light. How? Well, a baby changes everything. Verse six. For to us... A child is born. A baby comes. Now this is unexpected. If I told you that the God of the universe saw the darkness and corruption and difficulty in this world, if he saw the the war and the poverty and all of the problems and he promised a blessing, you would expect him to send an angel army or a great leader, political leader, or a mighty warrior you would not expect a baby. But that's what's coming. A baby's coming. A human baby born to a human mother. That is going to be the source of this blessing. Not only is this a baby, it says the next phrase, to us a son is given. Now that's strange language. We understand a baby being born, for to us a child is born. When a woman gets pregnant and gives birth to a son, a baby's been born. To us a son is given. Well, that begs the question, who gave? And the response is, God did. This is God's son that's being given. And the hint is, is not only will this baby be human because he's a baby born of a woman, but that this baby will also be divine because he is literally the son of God being given by God. Next phrase, and the government will be on his shoulders. This baby that's coming is not coming to set up a religion. He's not coming for a spiritual awakening. He's coming to reign and rule over the whole world. The government, all rule will be on his shoulders. He's coming to make all things right. He's coming to fix what's wrong in this world. And then he's given four titles. Beautiful titles, look at them with me. And he, this baby that changes everything, will be called, first of all, Wonderful Counselor. Now, when you hear that, you might think, oh, he's going to be a good listener. That's true, he is a good listener. But that's not really what that phrase means. It means that and more. Counselor means like advisor. And the idea here is, is that he's not going to need a cabinet to help him make his decisions. That he is going to be wise with the wisdom of God that he is going to come and make the right decisions. He will be his own counsel. 
and the things that he does will be good and right and just and wise. Imagine that this world run by someone full of infinite wisdom. The second title is even more shocking. He will be called Mighty God. Now, there's lots of people in the Bible and lots of people today who have God somewhere in their name. It's just part of their name. So if your name is Isaiah, that means God saves. It's got God's name in the name. If your name is Daniel, that means God is my judge. God's in the name. If your name is Micah, it is who is God. God's in the name. Elijah, Yahweh is God. Lots of people have God in their name. That's not what this is saying. This is saying this baby will have the title God. His title will be Mighty God. A baby whose title is Mighty God. This is why we call him the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is his name. Lord is his title. He has the title Mighty God. The third title is potentially confusing. Everlasting Father. That doesn't mean that the baby is God the Father. What it means is this baby who is rightly titled Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God will be a father figure to all his people. The idea is not only will he lead people with wisdom, but he will love them like a father loves his child. And look what it says about him. Again, this is stunning. Everlasting father. He will be a father figure forever and ever and ever. Everlasting father. And then finally, the last title, which interestingly is the only one that has any political connotations whatsoever. He will be a prince. That's a regal title. And it reminds us he's prince, meaning that this baby is coming to rule and reign on behalf of God the Father. But look what he's prince of. He's prince of peace. The word is shalom. It means wholeness, wellness, flourishing. It means all things in life the way they're supposed to be. Do you know what it means? Do, have you had the feeling of peace? Maybe you settle in with friends and you have a good conversation, a good meal, and you're just, you're content. Your heart's at rest. Maybe you have been separated from your children. They live in another state and they've come home for Christmas. And they walk in the door and you embrace them and something feels right. That's peace. Maybe you're in a job where you're doing the things you were designed to do and you feel peace. Maybe there's been a conflict with a friend and that's been resolved and you've been forgiven and you've been restored and you feel peace. This baby will be the prince of peace that what he is going to bestow is a world in which all relationships, our engagement with creation, our engagement with God, our engagement with others will be characterized by peace. Well, if that wasn't enough, verse seven just keeps upping the ante. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. You could also translate the word greatness as increase. So another way to say this is, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Not just will he bring peace, that peace will continue to grow forever and ever and ever. There will be no end. His government's greatness, his rule and his reign will continue to grow forever and ever. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and with upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. 
Lots of political leaders, business leaders, sports leaders have to get their hands dirty to try to get the thing that they want to have happen to happen. They've got to pull strings. They've got to pay bribes. They've got to do whatever it takes. That is not what this child will have to do. Everything he will do will be right and righteous and done with justice, not favoritism. Done in a way that is pure and good and holy. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Which reminds us that even though the language sounds past tense, for to us a son is born, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. From Isaiah's point of view, this is future. That God has said, this is what's coming. You see this passage that we just read was written 2,700 years ago. And it's a promise that God says, looking into the darkness, the gloom, and the distress of this world, I'm promising blessing, and the blessing will come because a baby will change everything. And that's why 700 years later, from when Isaiah was written, When a baby was born in Bethlehem, who was given the name Jesus, this is what was said in Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Same message from Isaiah 8. For I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the one prophesied and predicted from the Old Testament, the one that Isaiah 9 said was coming. The Lord, mighty God, This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. A baby changes everything. Even for Mary herself who has gone through a difficult pregnancy, taken a long trip, not had any room for her in the town of Bethlehem, even for Mary. In the midst of the struggle, this baby already begins to bring her peace. And not just for Mary, for the whole world. That God has seen the distress and the darkness of this world and he has sent his son, born of a woman so he is fully human but the very Son of God, so he is at the same time fully divine, that God sent his Son to bring light where there was darkness, joy where there was gloom, freedom where there's oppression, peace where there's war. A baby changes everything. And when you and I come to realize that that baby born in Bethlehem named Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, that this is that promised child, that 700 years before he was born, God said, I will send a child and that child will be called the Prince of Peace. When we come to realize that this baby who was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago grows up and performs miracles that only God himself could do, that this baby, when he grows up, dies on a cross for your sins and my sins, when we come to realize that God raised that same Jesus from the dead, and ascended him to heaven where he is currently seated at the right hand of God Almighty as the Prince of Peace, when we realize that that same Jesus predicted 2,700 years ago, who was born 2,000 years ago, will indeed return to this earth and will establish a kingdom that will have no end. When we come to realize that, then the baby changes everything for us. 
then we become part of this kingdom. And then in the midst of a world that's still full of darkness, gloom, and distress, you can go home today, I'm not recommending it, and you can turn on the internet, you can get on social media, you can look at news media, and I guarantee you there will be plenty of darkness and distress and trouble. And when you go back to work or you go back to school or you engage with family over Christmas or whatever it may be, you will remember this world is full of trouble and hardship and difficulty but the promise of God is that this Jesus does change everything that in the here and now in the here and now darkness begins to turn to light gloom starts to turn to joy oppression gives way to freedom war gives way to peace and when this Jesus returns He will establish a kingdom full of wisdom and power and love that will last forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, even the fact that we pray to you now, we're trying to assert our faith that we do indeed believe that you are seated at the right hand of the throne on high. How is it possible to believe that a little baby would come into this world and do all that you did? Open our eyes and give us faith to see. Lord, for me, it's amazing that 700 years before you were born, this was said about you. Who else could have fulfilled this? Who else in human history could this prophecy even possibly be about? But Lord, I'm able to see because you've been kind and opened my eyes. Lord, would you do that for everyone in this room? Lord, would you remind each one of us that you are the Prince of Peace. And for each one of us, in the midst of darkness and distress and difficulty, that you are a wonderful counselor, that you are almighty God, that you are everlasting Father, and that you are the Prince of Peace. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Calvary Church. We hope this message has brought the light and hope of God's presence into your life, refreshing your soul for the journey the Lord has you on. If you have a spiritual need or would like to connect further with the work God is doing through Calvary Church, seek us out online at calvarygr.org. On our website, you can also find an archive of previous messages from this series. Thanks for listening.